kind of get what David is saying here. Psalm 139. And let's read uh, together uh, verse number one. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou hast know, thou know, that knowest, excuse me, my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before. Thou hast laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall, uh, whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to the heaven, into the heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. Um, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being uh, unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned uh, when as yet there was none of them. Verse number 17, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with thee. I got to, I got to reading this psalm in my evening Bible devotions. And to be honest with you, it's not really left my mind. Have you ever just read something and it just sticks and it constantly keeps coming up in your daily life? And I began to meditate upon it. And uh, the Nashvillian in me uh, began to think of likening it to sweet tea. Um, when, I, when I think about this passage, it's sweet to the first taste. But then you leave it in the fridge overnight and then it's 10 times sweeter. I don't know what happens. I think by the end of the week, it becomes syrup and you can put it on pancakes. That's sweet tea. That's good sweet tea right there. But you know, that's, that's, that's how this text is. You read it once and it's, oh, it tastes really good. And then you meditate upon it the next day and, and, and you meditate upon it the next day and it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter as you meditate upon it. And when I read it, I think that David, as he's under divine inspiration, as he's writing and God is impressing these things upon him, he begins to think of God's goodness on him. Uh, he begins to think about God's hand in his life, and, and his heart is filled with such an adoration, he can't just help write. Have you ever just had a thought, or you needed to get something on paper, you needed to tell somebody something, and it's almost like your heart is like a balloon, it's, it's, it's ballooned up this far, and you have, to, you have to express it, you have to tell these things. And I believe that's David here in this psalm, trying to express his adoration for his God. You know, I study this, and a lot smarter people than me believe that David wrote this psalm when the kingdom of Israel was was put in his hands when it was established in his hands fully. If you want to write a Bible reference in your text, that's 1 Chronicles 13, verse 4. 1 Chronicles 13, 4. So imagine this. If I can put that into context. So why is David such, such, uh, such an emotional person right now? Why is he writing this with such adoration? Here's what I believe. We know that David escaped the spear of Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. We know that at this time in David's life, David had probably not too not too far from this time, had recovered his family that was taken into captivity at Ziklag. He had recovered everything. He was great. And now he's writing this psalm, and his political aspirations, his security is set. The kingdom of Israel is, is established in his hands. And here's David coming to this mountaintop experience in his life, and he looks back at the valley he's just walked through. And he's looking down with, with 2015 vision, right? He's, he's looking down at all the times that God's hand was upon him. And he's looking down at all the times that God has delivered him. And he's looking at about how God was, was with him and was his comfort and was his shield and was his glory. And, and he's seen all the goodness of God. And David's heart swells with adoration. David's heart swells with love. And he pens this letter. And he says this 
And I like this. If you want to underline this, in verse six, or verse six, he cries, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. If you're in the habit of marking things, underline that. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Can I, can I give you my interpretation of what David's saying here? He's almost saying this, God, I'm amazed and I'm astounded by the knowledge of your person. Such knowledge surpasses my comprehension. It surpasses my imagination. These truths that I've, that I've learned in my life are too lofty. My mind doesn't have a line that I can measure the infinite with. All I can do is just believe you. All I can do, God, is just adore you. H has God ever done something in your life so incredible that you just sit there in awe? Thank you, Lord. How did this work out? A, a door opens, an opportunity falls in your lap, a prayer gets answered, and why would God be so good to us? God, why, why are you so lovely to, to such evil sinners? All I can do is believe and adore you. I'm just a poor and limited man. I, if, I, if we were to stand on our tiptoes this morning, we could not touch the lowest step of the throne eternal. That's, that's, these things that we're learning this morning are high etern, eternal truths. Uh, and I, I see David's heart here. He's amazed at what God has done for him. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Such knowledge is too wonderful. What an exclamation born out of love. What an exclamation born out of God's help. And with, with God's help this morning, I really want to preach on that simple thought uh, about things being too wonderful. The title of my message this morning is How Wonderful It Is to Know. For those of you taking notes, the title is How Wonderful It Is to Know. I want us this morning to be overwhelmed at the presence of God again. I want God's people this morning to really be captured by the goodness and to be captured by the love of Christ this morning. Because can I tell you, this world is vying for our attention, isn't it? There's always something on our calendars. There's always something going on. There's always something to, to covet after. There's, there's, there's a new car. Oh, I love that car. I love there's always something, a new phone. There's always something new. There's always something that is brought across our table that for us to to, to covet after, to hunger after. But my goal this morning is to get us to be amazed and to wonder at some deep, eternal, infinite truths about our God. Sometimes I think we become so calloused. I heard a preacher say, we become gospel proof. The things, the wonderful things that once stirred our heart about God, and so I've heard those before. May this morning we be captured by some wonderful things about his person and about his role in our lives. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask God to bless these thoughts this morning, his word. Lord, we come to you, and God, we, Lord, we're needy people. Lord, we need you. Lord, we, we need you far more than we can admit. We need you far more than we, we can even fathom. God, and I need you. God, I'm a broken vessel. Lord, my mind is, is not what it should be. Lord, I, I need you. I need your, I need your help. I need your power this morning. And I pray, God, that this would not be a show. God, I pray this would be an opportunity to let Christ be exalted in the service and help us to leave here wondering and being filled with awe at your presence again. Let Christ be exalted this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For those of you taking notes this morning, when we think about this wonderful subject about our God, number one, how wonderful it is to know that God is acquainted with us, that God is acquainted with us. Look at verses one through four. Let the text speak to you this morning. David said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. God is acquainted with us. You know what's interesting? David opens this psalm. You know what he does not say? He, he, he does not say, God, you know everything. Now, we, as Christians, we, we know that God knows everything. And that is a true statement, right? But David makes it personal. David makes it personal to himself and says, God, yeah, you know everything, but God, you know me. Are, are, is there anybody in your life that knows who you really are? You know, I think sometimes we, I, I remember working for the IRS for several years, and I, you have your business face you put on. You have your, you know, when people are yelling at you, you're like, thank you for screaming in my face. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you. 
yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you're just gritting your teeth, and you have your business face on because you need your, your mortgage paid, right? And we understand, we understand that, that persona of, oh, thank you for spitting on me. I hope you have a great day, you know, and just, just that idea of, of trying to be professional and trying to be something that you're not, but then you go home, and you're like, can you, can you even believe what happened to me today? And the person who knows you says, how dare they talk to you like that? They don't know you like I know you, but can I tell you, we think we have people in our lives that know us, but God knows us far more infinitely and deeply than we can ever even fathom. He makes it personal. God, you know me. You know, our outward man and our inward man are just as visible to God. He sees them clearly this morning. Jehovah is the all-knowing God who understands us as if he examined us minutely. He knows the secret parts of your heart. You know, sometimes when people are talking to us, we have, we have like I said, that business face. But has anybody ever told you something and, and you couldn't hold your face back from the, from the real reaction? Sometimes you want to tell your face, hey, hey, calm it down. You know, somebody is telling you something so crazy, you're like, mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, you're, you're telling the truth with your face, face, but you're lying through your mouth, you know, like, oh, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's that. Oh, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Oh, you know, but you know, I think sometimes we, we put on that, that false facade, but God knows our, inter our internal as well as the out. Uh, he, he knows all of us. There was a time uh, when, when we were created, right? But he, there has never been a time when we were unknown to our great God. There will never be a moment when we are beyond his observation. Look at verse number two here god sees us at all times right whether we're lying down whether we're rising up all of our acts are known by our god think about this when we think when we sink in despair god sees us when we ascend in our pride and we think we're something god sees us he knows our down sitting he knows our uprising he knows my notions in my heart God even sees, look at verse 2, he knows the very thoughts that, uh, that, that are before they even enter my mind. He foreknows everything I'm going to say. Isn't it amazing that he still loves you? Isn't it amazing that he still forgives you even though he knows 20 minutes from now you're going to say something you shouldn't? You know, 20 minutes from now, you're going to get mad at somebody and you're going to explode and, and you're going you're gonna to feel bad about it later. But yet God still offers you his forgiveness. Yet God still offers you his love. Yet God still offers you his grace. God knows everything that you're going to say, but still decides to love you. What an, al what an almighty God. What a lovely God tonight, this morning rather. Uh, verse number three, he, he uses the word that God compasses us. That idea has the idea, that word, excuse me, has the idea of examining. And it also means to sift or to winnow uh, court, uh, corn from the chaff. You know, when we think about God encompassing us, my running and my resting are all in the circle of his observation. He sees us, but that word means this. He also judges everything that we do. So God sees everything, but he, he separates the corn from the chaff, if you will, right? He, he sees the actions that we do. Was that right or was that bad? You know, sometimes we think that the darkness hides, from what, from, from, uh, hides us from God, right? Sometimes we think no one's looking. Sometimes we think you know, nobody knows my thoughts. No, I can think that thought and get away from it. May I say that God is acquainted with you. He knows who you are. You are, you are plain. You are visible to him. He is not shocked. He knows everything everything about you. Verse number four, look at that. He knows every word we speak. His divine knowledge is perfect. You know, we, we talked about wearing masks around other people. We do that. That's, that, that's our temptation sometimes, um, unless that you were never taught to do that, right? Sometimes we wear masks around other people, you know, um, and, but our great God knows us. Everything we say or think is transparent before our great God. Now you sit here this morning and say, how is that comforting? How is that comforting to me? How, how can I take that through this week and, and know that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm loved? Can I tell you that it's comforting because God knows where you are. Have you ever talked to somebody and something's important to you and you can tell they're not listening? And you're like, you don't understand X, Y, and Z and, and A, B, and C. And they're like, huh, what? Does that make you feel important? Does that make you feel like they care about you? You know, to me, I hate, and I think I, I must hate myself because I do that to my wife a lot. I hate when people don't listen to me and I'm trying to talk to them. You know, uh, we, we were all imperfect. You know, there's somebody I know who will not be named, who when I'm trying to talk to them, if they're on their cell phone, you know, and they're typing something, I can literally say anything. You know, so I stole a million dollars today. That's, that's great, honey. 
You know, <laughs> I love my wife. And I have far more against me than she has against her. But, you know, sometimes you, you, you're trying to be like, and then this happened, this happened. And it's like, oh, okay. Or, you know, and I do that to her. She, I'll zone out. How many of you men zone out? That, don't you lie in church. You know, it's time for truth, right? Sometimes we're, we're, we're listening and it's like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. And that doesn't make you feel special. It doesn't make you feel like somebody cares for you. But can I tell you, there is somebody who is listening. There is somebody who knows where you are. There is somebody who knows when you're down in the doldrums. And there's somebody who knows when you're on the mountaintops. Your down sittings, your uprisings, are, that is something he is acquainted with. He knows where you are. And may I say, he cares where you are. He cares to know. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably too nosy of a person where if I find out something, I'll ask my wife 100 questions about it. She'll say, I talked to such and such today. What'd they say? And then what'd you say? And then what you say? And then she's like, I don't have details for you, but you want to know why? If it's somebody I care about, I want to know a lot about it, right? I want to know what their burden is. I want to know how to pray. I, I, not just, you know, I'm not trying to gossip, right? I want to know so I know how to pray, so I know how to, how to counsel, so I know how to, how to love, how, how I know how to, you know, be, be the pastor that God called me to be. You want to know why? Because I care. And I think God knows so much about us because he cares, so much about us he sees where you're at he loves you this morning you are not out of his view he encompasses you he is acquainted with you you are important number two look at verses five through ten i believe it is wonderful to know that god is around us number two how wonderful it is to know that god is around us look at what david said thou god has beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me what what is he saying there you know what that word idea that word picture he's painting there it, you know i watch a lot of war movies that's my thing i like history you know if, if i flew by netflix i'm watching a, a documentary and her eyes are going to roll fifty thousand times i'm just a, a boring person who likes history and I'm, I'm watching about um you know hitler's inner circle and all these other things but occasionally you'll watch a movie where the where the enemy will surround a position completely and there's one guy in the middle and there's like 50 guns encircling that person and what do they do they drop their guns you got me right can i tell you that word when it says that god surrounds us he surrounds us like if you will like in that picture he it's almost like an enemy surrounding the castle walls you can't escape it you are encompassed you are in his sight god is around you you are surrounded by the lord he he is behind us either recording our sins or in grace blotting out the remembrance of them he is before us he foreknows our deeds and can i tell you the god who knows what you're going to do is the same god who's ahead of you providing for you do you know our god it is said that he knows our very needs before we even ask them that's our god this morning I, listen i think sometimes like i said we are we are so tempted to be gospel proof may the holy spirit of god break the fallow ground and may we wonder at our god's love for us and you say well i've heard it before well, let us be reminded about how unworthy we are you say well i hate to feel unimportant we deserve nothing we have broken, we are, we, are, we are lawbreakers before our God. We have broken his commandments. We deserve nothing. We only have standing because of his grace this morning. Think about his love for us, but think about how he is around us. Uh, he is before us. He knows our deeds. He provides for our needs. We cannot turn back and escape from his envelopment. And I like this. Look, he says, and lay thy hand upon me. Can I tell you, God is not just circling you like a faraway enemy. He's close enough to put his hand on you. May I say this, Christian, if you're in Christ, if there's been a time where you've turned from your sins and asked Christ to be your Savior, the Father has wrapped his arms around you. Some, some commentators think that this refers back to a physician where he puts his hand upon you to know your condition. Can I tell you, there is a friend, the Bible says, that sticketh closer than a brother. Have you ever had a fair weather friend before? A friend who, when the times got tough, they, they threw you to the curb. Have you ever had somebody who, who, at one time, you weren't important to them anymore, and maybe 
I think maybe as a teenager, I think I suffered that a lot. Maybe, and, and later in life, I, I realized that people are sometimes teenagers in adults' bodies, you know, when it comes to friendships. And I've been left by the curb and been like, what did I do? What did I do? And it hurts, right? To know that to, I've been forsaken and to know that that, that that person doesn't want to deal with me anymore and that person could care less if I get hit by a car. You're like, there are people like that. Yes, that's going to happen if it hasn't happened to you once in your life. But can I tell you, there's one person who will never leave thee nor forsake sake thee and he constantly has his hand upon thee can i tell you who that is that's the lord and savior jesus christ he is constantly around you and you say well well how is that comforting to me can i tell you that he's with you in the trial he's with you when you go through that sickness he's with you when you don't know what to do he is that friend that's sick and closer than a brother you know i have family members that i love but there are times when i'm like okay <laughs> good to see you <laughs> see you in four years you know he is closer than a brother he is somebody that i want to be around he's somebody that constantly loves me he's somebody that constantly is with me that is our god who is constantly around us and has his hand upon us verse number seven look there david he, he asked this question he says whither shall i go from thy spirit or whither shall i flee from thy presence verse eight if i ascend up to heaven thou art there and if i make my bed in hell behold thou art there verse nine and if i take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea even there shall thy hand lead me. Have you ever seen that before? And thy right hand shall hold me. Preacher, what are you saying this morning? David did not want to escape from God's presence. The sweet psalmist of Israel knew what it was to know God. But he asked a question to prove that there is no escape. There is no escape from his presence. He, here's what he says. I wrote this down. If I ascend to heaven or, or descend to hell, God, you're everywhere. If I try to fly to some distant sea, we'd only be able to fly there by your power. God, you would lead me. You would cover me. You would preserve me. You would sustain me even in my rebellion. You think about this. God is so wonderful. When we run from him, he still gives us what we need to run from him. You know, it's almost like, can you imagine like little kids, you know, when they, when they, when they hit like 13 or, you know, 12 and they start going, I'm going to run away from home. <laughs> I'm going to run away from home. And it's the mother saying, here's your sack of lunch, hon. Let me, let me drive you to the bus station. Here's a plane ticket. Here, I got you a hotel in California. You call me when you get there. Your uncle's going to pick you up, right? And we say, that's funny. Can I tell you, how many times have we run from our God? And God says, I'll give you the strength. But God, I'm mad at you. That's fine. I got a sack of lunch of grace for you. But God, I, I don't care anything about what you say. That's fine. I still love you. Think about the goodness of God that he is still with us and provides for us even in our fleeing. Can I tell you? That is love infinite. That is love eternal that you and I sometimes forget, that you and I sometimes don't meditate upon, that you and I don't let in grasp our soul. Can I tell you, we have never experienced a love outside of Christ like that. Christ is the only one who loves us that way. Christ is the only one who preserves us in power and mercy. Those times of rebellion are those times of grace. There are times when I have not been faithful to God but he has been faithful to me. If you're saved this morning, you can't escape him. You're never out of his reach. May I say, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, there have been times when I have run from him, but there has never, nor never shall there ever be a time when he will run from me. My God is always around his children. Think of those times, never leave thee nor forsake me too wonderful to comprehend this morning can i ask you this morning for those of you who know christ as your savior aren't you glad that he never gave up on you aren't you glad there wasn't a day when he said i'm sick and tired as as the potter saying i'm done with the clay throw it away aren't you aren't you glad there were times when you were a vessel unworthy and you were you were not usable you were on the shelf you were a vessel not of honor but of dishonor and maybe there were times in your life where your devotions were trash where your bible reading was non-existent where your love for god had cooled and become lukewarm and was sickening to god that god gave you his grace that god loved you that god provided you that god opened relationships relationships for you to have people to love you and to cherish you and gave you opportunities and, and has blessed you and yet 
we have been unfaithful to him, and yet he is still faithful to us. I'm glad that he has not given up, that he has not left our presence. You know, I think about those people that have left my presence. They got sick of me. You ever been sick of anybody? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand in church. Because with that hand comes that eye. No, don't. No, we ain't splitting this morning. Amen. But have you ever just gotten sick of somebody? And, you know, you, it's, it's like almost every word they say, you're like, mm-hmm. I hate the word you say that. I hate the way you say that word, water. I hate, I hate the way that you, I hate, I hate the, I hate the, I hate the way you smell, ugh, you know, I don't, and it, and it just becomes manufactured hate because you, the root of bitterness springing up, and you know, there are some people you're like, you know what, I need a vacation, you, maybe it's co-workers and all those people say it, amen, but you know, maybe it's somebody, we have, listen, I, we're all sinners, we understand what it is to be done with somebody for a little bit, and some of you are saying, preacher, we're done with you for a little bit, you know, we understand, we understand what it is to, to be done with people, but can I tell you, God's never done with us. God is never sick of us. God loves the way we say things. God loves the way we think things. God loves the way we do things. You want to know why? Because he is our creator. He is the God who, is, who loves us and who is encompassed with us. With our, with, he comes to us with his presence. He wants to be around us. Listen, that is a thought too wonderful to undeserving sinners. And this kind of goes hand in hand. Number three, how wonderful it is to know that God adores us, that God adores us. Look at verse 17 and 18. This is pretty cool. He says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, look at this. They are more, God's thoughts toward us are more in number than the sand when I awake, I am still with thee. Isn't it wonderful to know that God loves you? David is comforted in this passage. He's comforted to know that God loves him, right? That, that God is around him, that God provides for him. But there, there's a deeper love that we want to explore. He says, how precious are thy thoughts? How costly? How valued are thy thoughts? How dear is your special attention? If we really understood what it was to have God's thoughts toward us, we'd realize how rich we were. God thinks about us with thoughts innumerable this morning. God thought upon us about, uh, from old eternity and continues to think upon us from every moment. And there will never come a time when God does not think upon us. He had thoughts of pardon for us. He had thoughts of renewal for us. He had thoughts of upholding of for us, of supplying for us, of educating us, of perfecting us. And it should fill us with wonder that God has so many thoughts toward us, the undeserving. You know, the only thought God should have toward us, how quickly do they deserve hell? But yet, before we were even created, God had thoughts of receiving you back to himself. Before you were even, before you were even, <laughs> even thought of an Adam, right? Before Adam even thought of, of a future generation, you had already had God's thoughts upon you. We are so insignificant and worthy. He says, how great are the sum of these thoughts that I should count them. They're more in number than the sand. God's thoughts towards us are innumerable and nothing can surpass the grains of sand which belt our oceans and seas, even if we should count them. Catch this. If the, the University of Hawaii, I'm going to give you something, has estimated this. But even if we could count the number of grains that, of sand that line this planet, that number would fail or pale, excuse me, in comparison to the true number of thoughts God has toward you. We, when we talk about salvation, we make it personal. It's not just, God, you know, we understand God died for the whole world, but God died for you, for me. God doesn't just love the whole world. He loves you. God doesn't just care about the world. He cares about you beyond anything you could ever imagine. There is no limit to his divine love. He had thoughts of love towards you before he spoke, let there be light. And I love this. Before you were even created, he thought out your whole salvation. You know, for, for those of you in this room who know Christ, do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when the whole, and it's, it's burned in my mind. I remember I, my short testimony is I grew up Catholic. Um, and we, we call them cafeteria Catholics where I come from. You kind of just pick and choose what you believe. You know, if you want some Mary today, that's fine. If you want the rosary today, that's fine. If, if you want communion today, that's fine. But, you know, as long as you, you claim, you know, you're religious, you're going to heaven. But I didn't have peace. I searched religion. I went to Buddhism, Islam. I went even to, to really 
paganism. I went to, you know, Greek mythology. I went to demon worship. I went to devil worship. And I even became basically a, a glorified agnostic. And I tried to call myself an atheist. But I, and during my whole time, I was searching for love. I was searching for peace. I was searching to no know forgiveness. But there was a time when I, I heard the gospel and I knew I needed to be saved. I knew that Jesus died for me. I knew that Jesus rose again. And if I turned from my sin and put my eternity on him, I'd go to heaven. That was my, that was my only hope. And I remember bowing beside my couch and trusting Christ. I remember it to this day. If I, we tried to, when I went to, to Virginia, I think it was like two or three years ago, somebody else had bought her house and it had been, exchange, it had been changed over many times. And my personality, I'm just going to knock on the door. I'm going to knock on the door to see if I can get in because I want to go see that spot. And my family's like, they're going to think you're trying to murder their whole family. I'm like, it's fine. I'm pretty sure they saw me and didn't open the door. But I tried to knock and I couldn't get in. But if I could have gotten in my house, I could take you to the spot where I knelt and I put my faith and trust in Christ. And that's a precious memory to me. But you know what? That before I was even created, before God spoke, let there be light, God saw that and had thoughts about me coming to Christ. That's how much my God loves his children. He is constantly thinking about us. Jesus, think about these thoughts that Jesus would come and die for you. The innocent lamb would carry your sin to a cross and die in your place as a criminal. Christ would be the sin bearer. He would take your judgment. He would take your separation. And then the thoughts that he would rise again the third day to save you. Can I tell you, the thoughts of his salvation to us cannot be numbered. How wonderful it is to know that God, he adores you. Isn't that so wonderful to know that God loves you this morning? Can I give you something I studied? There are over 2 billion seconds in 70 years, okay? The University of Hawaii estimated the number of sand grains in the seas were over 7 quintillion. That's 30 zeros. So I want you to take that ratio in your mind of 70 seconds, right, or, or, 70, or of seconds in 70 years, and divide that by the number of sand grains. You know what that is? If you divide those two figures, that's 3 billion, 500 million thoughts per second for each person, 7 billion of them in 70 years. David says God is so infinite, that is not even close to the number of thoughts he thinks towards you. Let me give you that quote. Let a second go by. Let me tell you how many times God has thought about you in that second. Over 3 billion, 500 million thoughts towards you. Me? Towards you. Why? Because he loves you with a love that is so infinite. He is infinite. He is eternal. He doesn't dwell in time. Time is in God. He is, he is the uncaused first cause. He is, he is everything. He, he is he, the, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. And he has thought about how many, how many millions and billions and billions of thoughts has God had, to you with, ha, had for you in the last hour? Maybe there are thoughts of redemption. Maybe you've never trusted Christ and God has been thinking about you and about you coming to him. Wouldn't it be a shame if God spent that much time thinking of you and giving his son to die and rise again to save you and you rejected his love and you rejected his payment for your sin? Wouldn't that be a shame? Think about it. Let's take a moment again. How many thoughts has God thought towards you? Think about that this morning. Christian, saved person, how much have you thought about him this week? How much have you desired his presence? How much have you loved him? Have you been acquainted with him reading his word? Have you been around him in times of prayerful dedication? Can I tell you, God loves us with a love that is infinite. We agree. But may that wonder not be just housed in this building. May these temples take out that message to this world. May the love of Christ ooze out of us. There's a, isn't, I think there's a, a picture that says, I want to be so full of Christ if a mosquito bites me, he goes away singing there's power in the blood. You know, I want to be so filled with God that just, that just heaven's presence radiates off my face. We read in the Old Testament how when Moses saw, uh, saw a theophany or God face to face, that his face shined so brightly, the people were so terrified from the reflection that they asked his face to be basically covered, right? I wonder if God has put so much thought and so much love and so much effort and so much 
thinking and being around you and loving you and providing for you, have we reciprocated in any way this week? Have we loved him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might, or is it a Sunday thing? Is it something that carries with us this week? And maybe if you don't know Christ, Christ is thinking about you this morning. Christ is thinking, I'd love to save you. I died for you. I was buried for you. I rose again, not only to reconcile you to an almighty God, but to take you to heaven when you die. And if you trust me, if you put your eternity on me, I'd sure love to have you. Every person that has ever lived, God has thought about their redemption. You say, I'm too bad. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I am in life. I don't. But can I tell you, God knows where you are. God's around you. He knows everything you're going to say before you say it. And in spite of all of that, take your Bibles. I'm going to end with this. Take your Bibles to Romans 5. Take your Bibles to Romans 5. I want you to hear a promise of God this morning. A promise from heaven to those who say, I am too bad. Romans 5, 8. Hear, hear, the, hear the words of heaven this morning. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth, that's an old word for proved, but God proved or commended his love towards you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? He saw the very worst thing you would do. He knew what you were going to do. He knew what you would be. He knew the past you choose. He knew what would happen in your life. And still his thoughts towards you were unabated. Still his thoughts to you were without number. Still his presence was not denied. Still his grace was given to you. Listen, there are people that live their lives and shake their fists at God and say, God won't tell me to do anything. I'm going to live my life the way I want. Can I tell you, God still supplies for them, still gives them grace, still gives them opportunity, still thinks thoughts of peace towards them and peace and love and wants them in his presence forever and the saddest thing is when people die and they say you know what i've lived my life not caring for anything about god can you imagine standing before god as an unsaved person and saying i'm sorry and looking him face to face and saying i know you thought about me and maybe in heaven seeing the actual quintillions of thoughts upon quintillions of thoughts and quintillions of thoughts that he thought about you and still saying, I never once considered Christ. And Christian, may, would that be us? Have we filled our lives with so much junk, with so much passing fad, with so much temporary things, with so much worldly love that we look upon our great God and say, God, I have not reciprocated. God, you have been faithful to me, but I cannot honestly say I've been faithful to thee. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How wonderful it is to know these things. If we could have everyone stand. Hi, this is Pastor Ryan. I want to thank you for taking time to watch our video, and I really hope it was a blessing to you. Uh, if you found that it was a blessing, please do us a favor and share this video with your friends. And uh, if you are in the Newcastle, Indiana area, and you're looking for a church, or you're not involved in a church, and you would like to come check us out, I want to just personally invite you to do so, okay? I want to thank you for all of your time today, and I want to say God bless you. Thank you.